I get a bit worried about where we are at present, but no more than 25%. But frankly, 25's a big number in the global risk game, as you know. I mean, no one's going to be comfortable hearing Kevin Rudd thinks war, one in four, North Korea. Hi everyone, I'm Ian Bremmer. This is your G Zero World. Today we have former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. Very dry wit and all around good guy. We're gonna talk about China, the United States, North Korea, and the world. But first, this week. Is populism dead in Europe? That's what people have been saying. Certainly when Macron won in France and now in Germany, Merkel with her fourth term in a row, feels like the economies are picking up, maybe we don't have to worry so much about European implosion. Not so fast. Don't look at digital outcomes. Look at what's happening underneath the surface in all of these countries, and you'll see the level of distress, discontent with elites across the European continent and the UK as well is only picking up. Let's start with Germany. We had those elections, no question that the big parties were the ones that everyone in the establishment was gonna still bring back to office, but the Alternatives for Deutschland party, the Euro skeptics, for the first time ever in the Bundestag, with 13% of the vote, and so many of those people, the over six million Germans that voted for him, these were people that did not like the strong leadership of that party, they just opposed everything else. In particular, in East Germany, former East Germany, where people feel like the reunification has gotten them nothing. They've been left behind. It's the Appalachia uh, outside Bavaria. Um, and uh, you had 27% of men of voting age saying, I'm voting for the German nationalists. I want out. I want away from Merkel. Um, that is going to completely constrain her ability to develop a new coalition government. It t could take months to put it together. It's going to make her weaker on the migrant issue. It's going to make her weaker on issues like integrating Europe more strongly and make it harder for her to come to terms with the UK over a long and contentious Brexit. If there were a leader of the free world, yes, it would be Angela Merkel, but there isn't, there isn't even a leader of free Europe. Another person who'd like that title is clearly Emmanuel Macron, president of France, just gave a speech this week, 90 plus minutes. He was more pro-Europe than I've ever seen in decades from a European leader. He wants more European defense. He wants European universities. He wants European fiscal integration. The only problem is the people who voted for him in France want none of those things. There are definitely globalists and pro-Europeans in France, but most people in France were voting against the establishment parties. Remember, during that election, Macron almost didn't make the second round. The communists did better than the socialists in the first round. The far-right National Front did better than the center-right. It was only because Macron had a new party and said, I represent a new way. But now that he's giving talks about let's get Europe stronger again, for a lot it feels like the old way. And no surprise that while he started with 60% approval, a few months in he's down to 40. Most precipitous drop of any leader in France winning the presidency since World War II. And then in Spain, this weekend, a referendum on independence of Catalonia. The referendum itself has been ruled by the courts illegal, and so as a consequence, the Spanish government and Prime Minister Rajoy has been playing real hardball. He arrested a bunch of Catalan officials, let them go shortly afterwards. There's been massive demonstrations. Wouldn't shock me if we see violence this weekend. They don't want this referendum to go ahead. It's going to go ahead. The outcome is going to be contentious, to say the least. It's not going to be great for the Catalans in terms of their financial capacity. They're not doing as well economically as they have historically. But there'll be real questions about the outcome, not least because like so many elections across Europe, 
the Russians have been playing with fake news and engaging with social media and propaganda all the way through. We took a look over the course of the last few weeks and saw actually that the people that have had the most influence around the Catalan referendum on social media, folks like Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, WikiLeaks, and RT.com. Interestingly, Julian Assange wrote me saying it was sad uh, that I focused on that as opposed to the dissidents who wanted this illegal referendum to go through. Look, I think all sides are important here, but you can't forget about the Russian angle because ultimately it's going to further sharpen and polarize the outcomes on the ground that we see next week. And now, your big interview. I have Kevin Rudd. Uh, the two-time Prime Minister of Australia, Foreign Minister before that, now President of the Asia uh, Society's Policy Institute, and most importantly, uh, big thinker on all things Asian and geopolitics, uh, ancient proverb that if you want to talk about any of that and don't talk to Kevin Rudd, you're leading a life not worth living. Or else you're seriously entertainment deprived. Yes. So that's also that's, true. That's an ancient proverb as well. How so, are you? Very well. Very well. Uh, good to see you. Likewise. Yeah. He's got the boot game. He's today. doing the Trudeau thing. I'm just doing the traditional Australian thing. On to things more <laughs> weighty. Uh, to what extent do you think that uh, North Korea is actually likely to go boom? Historically, it's been about a 5% risk, uh, including when they started uh, going nuclear from, let's say, 1994 on or really 2006 on. But I think events in the last uh, year or so have edged that up considerably to somewhere between 20 and 25 percent. And the reason I say that is just that there are so many new factors at play. It's um, one, the material progress of the North Korean program, faster than most of the technical community thought. Uh, secondly, China demonstrating, at least until now, that they've not been willing to apply the pressure necessary to either cause a freeze on the North Korean program, let alone anything more serious. And thirdly, a big question mark about um, the uh, public language and substantial policy of the US administration under Trump. Put all that together, you know, I sometimes wonder whether in that decade leading up to the First World War, when we slept, walked into war, uh, where diplomacy was not as sharp as it should have been, where everyone thought that war was impossible yeah. and that gave a level of permission about what people thought they could get away with. I get a bit worried about where we are at present, but no more than 25%, but frankly, 25's a big number in the global risk game, as mm. you know. Sure. I mean, no one's gonna be comfortable hearing Kevin Rudd thinks war, one in four, North Korea, especially South Korea. Do you think, I mean, there has been progress in terms of sanctions and the Security Council in particular, in terms of what they're saying. But do you think that that actually translates to implementation on the ground, especially when it comes to China and the North Korean economy? Up until now, we just measure UN sanctions against uh, results. Uh, results are zero. Um, so, really? Truly zero? Well, look at material North Korean behavior. I mean, we've had a raft of sanctions now going back <clears throat> basically ever since this guy took over, Kim Jong-un. 93 missile tests since he's taken over, and we're up to nuclear test number six. So, but the interesting thing about the last set of sanctions, uh, which you correctly point to, is the, uh, for the first time, the inclusion of some limitations on oil. Um, the Chinese have historically resisted that uh, mm -hmm. comprehensively. And I think that uh, reflects a degree of frustration on Xi Jinping's part with Pyongyang that none of the signaling, private or public, has caused any abatement in their, in their testing program. I think what really upset him was that last nuclear test when the BRICS summit was being held in Xiamen. Talk about trying to rain on someone's parade. And when the Chinese came out publicly and said it wasn't a big priority at the summit, my interpretation of that was it was a big priority at the summit. If you were advising Trump, would you tell him, in addition to all of these sticks, to actually try any carrots? And what would the carrot be if there was a big one? All this analysis has to come back to one thing. What do you need to do to push that group in Beijing, uh, calling for a reappraisal of Chinese policy uh, to get a stronger position in Beijing and therefore for the Chinese to apply much more direct economic and financial leverage against 
the North Korean regime? That's the core question. A lot of the rest of everything else is sort of secondary and tertiary to that. So in terms of the China relationship, I think uh, if North Korea is our central strategic question at present, it would be useful for the Trump administration to frankly put the rest of the China relationship into working order at present, uh, de-escalated in terms of South China Sea stuff, de-escalated in terms of trade tensions, in order to create an environment where you could talk about what do we actually need to do to freeze this North Korean program. I'm wondering, do you see China now inexorably on the path towards becoming a second superpower? Well, it hangs on the definition of a superpower, um, which is you know, the classic um, measures, both uh, economic and military. Uh, and if the definition of a superpower in part is global military reach, um, China's not there yet. Do you think that the American foreign policy community is suitably aware of how quickly these things are changing and will matter to this country? I've been in the United States now for about three years. Yep. And um, I remember in my first year here, after I came second in our national elections, uh, that means I lost, so kind of, that was the end of being prime minister. So I came here as a political refugee. If Trump was president then, would they I, wouldn't let you. They wouldn't let me in. No. Yeah, okay. So I just snuck in under the, under the radar. But in my three years here, and I've talked about China kind of around the tracks uh, here in the United States, there was a generally distant view that China represented any substantive regional, but certainly not global challenge to the United States. And when I would start to outline what I'd describe as uh, the world as I saw it, just as Xi Jinping became president of China, the response I would tend to get was, yeah, it won't work. Uh, our economy just can't survive. It can't defy gravity. Too much debt, too much this, too much that. Um, the wheels will fall off their military. It's going to be politically unstable and the country will internally divide. Well, that's kind of like every CIA analysis I've seen declassified um, over the last 30 years, uh, predicting much the same thing. Mm. Uh, the United States needs a comprehensive national strategy for its engagement with China. It's no longer something that can just be kicked down the road and say, oh, state will look after that and commerce will fix that. The Pentagon will you know, be active in the South China Sea from time to time. And we'll see what the other agencies do and the intelligence agencies. And that's that. Thank you very much. Next problem. Let's get back across the Atlantic. Um, it ain't like that. You know, the world, as you know, is moving phew, uh, to the other hemisphere just in terms of the mathematics and the scale of the question. Kevin Rudd, global thinker, prime minister, descendant of convicts, and strangely attractive. Both, both sides of my family, and I will, <laughs> I, will, I will ignore that last remark. See you, mate. Be good. Good to see you. <laughs>